Number six in the series is titled, Let Us Bow Down and Worship. And I'd just like to mention that it is absolutely indispensable that you not only be here tonight, but that you be here for the next presentation tomorrow night. Because I'm going to present two sides of the same coin. This evening, we're going to talk about worship to God. And tomorrow evening, we're going to talk about the counterfeit, which is worship to the beast. And so I hope that everyone is planning on coming back uh, to our next lecture because these are twin lectures that go together. Now, as we examine the book of Revelation, we discover something that is absolutely clear. And that is that the final controversy will involve two objects of worship. And each of those objects has its particular sign of authority. But before we get into this more deeply, we do want to ask the Lord's presence in our study. And so I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before your throne. We thank you so much for uh, not keeping your secrets about what will happen in the future. Thank you for revealing these things to your prophets so that we can read the prophets and we can understand what will happen in the future. I ask, Lord, that you will give us the assurance that you will be with us even to the end of the age. Help us not to fear, for we know how things will end. So be with us as we study this very important subject, and we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. As I was mentioning, the final controversy, according to the book of Revelation, is between two objects of worship and their respective signs of authority. It is between the true creator God and his seal and the beast and his mark. In other words, that is the conflict or the controversy that will transpire at the very end of time. And so because the final conflict has to do with worship, we need to discuss in our subject today issues concerning worship, how the Bible sees worship. And so I want to begin by asking this question. How is God, the true God, distinguished from every false pretender? Let's go to 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 26. 1 Chronicles 16 and verse 26 where we have the explanation of what distinguishes the true God from every false pretender. It says there in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 26, For all the gods of the peoples are idols. Now comes the contrast. But the Lord made the heavens. So what distinguishes God, the true God, from all false God, gods or false pretenders? It is the fact that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Now, because God is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and we are his creatures, we owe him our worship. We worship him because he is the creator. Let's notice this point in Psalm 95 and verses 1 through 6. This passage, when I was pastor of, uh, senior pastor of Fresno Central, every Sabbath we would read this passage to introduce our worship service. It says there in Psalm 95, verse 1, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. And now comes the reason why we're supposed to shout with joy. For the Lord is what? The great God and the great king above all gods. Now why is God the great God above all gods? Notice verse 4. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. So why do we worship God? Because God is the Creator. You notice here three expressions, three synonymous expressions. Let us worship, let us bow down, let us kneel 
before the Lord, our maker. So we worship God as a true God because he is the creator. And what distinguishes the true God from all false gods is the fact that God is the creator. Notice another verse that teaches the same idea that we are to worship God because he is the creator. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Here, uh, the author of the book of Nehemiah, it's believed it might be Nehemiah, it's not absolutely certain, but it's an inspired book of the Bible. It says, you alone are the Lord. Now, why is God alone the Lord? Well, let's continue reading. You have what? Made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven, what? Worships you. Why does the host of heaven worship the Lord? Because God is what? God is the creator. So the first two points that I want us to have very clear in our minds is, number one, what distinguishes the true God from all false pretenders is the fact that God is the creator. And because, second point, because God is the creator, we owe God as his creatures, what? We owe God worship. Is that point clear? Now, in order to understand why we should worship God because he is the creator, of course, it would help us to go back to the story of creation. How can you talk about the need to worship God who is the creator and not go back to Genesis to discuss the creation story? So if we want to understand why we worship God, we need to go back to the story of creation. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31 and we'll read through chapter 2 and verse 1. Now this is the conclusion of God's work of creation, the first six days of creation week. It says there in Genesis 1 verse 31, Then God saw everything that he had made. Don't forget that. Everything that, how, how much did man make? Yes. Nothing. This is very important. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So when did God, uh, when did God finish his work of creation? Sixth the sixth day. Notice what it continues saying in chapter 2 and verse 1, which really belongs with chapter 1, even though it begins chapter 2. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were what? Were finished. So when did God finish his work? After how many days did God finish his work? It says that God finished his work at the end of the sixth day, and God did all of the work. But now we have a slight little problem. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3. Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. It says there, and we're going to unpack these two verses because there's several points that we want to emphasize here. It says, and on the seventh day, which day? Seven. The seventh day, God ended his work. Now, wait a minute. Didn't we just read that he finished his work the sixth day? Correct. You know, the, the word ended here is the identical word finished in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1. It's the identical word. So, you know, you say, now, wait a minute. So the question is, how could God have finished the sixth day, and also finished the seventh day. Let's finish reading these verses. And on the seventh day God ended, or finished, the same word, finished his work which he had done. And he rested. The word Shabbat, it actually a better translation would be he ceased. The seventh day he created no more, he ceased. So he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then... God blessed the seventh day and what? And sanctified it because in it he rested or ceased from all his work which God had created and made. So the first question that we want to ask is this. 
How could God finish his work the sixth day and then finish his work the seventh day? It says so clearly here. Didn't Moses see that there might be a contradiction here when he was writing this? There is no contradiction. I give the following illustration. I want you to imagine a master artist. A master artist is painting this beautiful scene of nature. He gets the canvas and he put, it puts it on the frame. And uh, the first day he adds some colors to, to the canvas. And after the first day he looks and he says, oh, it's good. So the second day he comes and, and uh, he adds a few colors and objects to the, to the canvas. And at the end of the second day he steps back and he says, it's good. So the third day he comes and he adds a few objects there and uh, trees maybe and flowers and so on. And after he finishes the third day he says, ah, it's good. And so he does the same the fourth day and the fifth day and the sixth day. And on the sixth day he puts the final touches to this beautiful scenery of nature on the canvas. Has he finished his work of art? Yes and no. You say, now wait a minute, yes and no? Yes, he finished it. He's not going to add any more colors to the canvas. But is there something missing? What is missing? His signature identifying who painted the canvas. Are you with me? God finished painting the canvas of nature, a living canvas, in six days. But on the seventh day, God signed his work of creation to identify who made it. Are you with me? So the Sabbath is definitely part of creation week. Now, three times in this passage, it says that the Sabbath is which day of the week? Three times it says that the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. And what three things did God do at creation week? He rested. And then he what? He blessed the Sabbath. And then he what? He sanctified the ha Sabbath or he made it holy. Now I want you to remember these things because we're going to come to another passage in a few moments. Are you clear so far? Now, let's examine some facts about the days of creation. The days of creation were literal 24-hour days like we know them today. How do you know that, you say? There are several reasons. Reason number one is that each day had an evening and a morning. It would be absolutely absurd to say that the day had an evening and a morning if the day lasted for thousands or millions of years. Secondly, there is an immediacy in the language that is used for creation. We are told in the book of Psalms that God spoke and it was done. That is saying that God spoke and it was done. It doesn't say he spoke and millions of years later so it was done. He spoke and it was done according to Psalm 33. Furthermore, there's an interesting expression that is used in the creation story several times. And it is that when God made something, it says, and it was so. It would be absurd to say it was so after one billion years. No, God spoke and it was so according to the creation story. Furthermore, the Sabbath in the fourth commandment in the book of Exodus proves that the days of creation were literal days. And you say, why is that? Because God says, and we're going to come back to this in a few moments, God said, you work six and you rest the seventh, because I worked six and rested the seventh. It would be absolutely ridiculous for God to say, you work six and rest the seventh because I worked six and rested the seventh if the days that God worked and rested were millions of years. Are you with me or not? God is saying, I worked six literal ones, I rested the seventh literal one, now you follow my example. You work six literal days and you rest on the seventh literal day. Are you following me or not? Now, were there any Jews at the beginning at creation week? No, the word Jew comes from Judah, son of Jacob, after sin. 
So let me ask you, was the Sabbath made for the Jews? Absolutely not. The Sabbath was instituted by God for the whole human race because the whole human race descends from Adam and Eve. Now, the Sabbath in its original function has nothing to do with redemption. You know, you'll find evangelicals today, they'll say, well, you know, the Sabbath uh, was in the Old Testament a sign of the coming Messiah, the rest that we were going to have in Jesus. So uh, the important thing is the spiritual rest. It's not keeping the day. The problem with that idea is that when God created the Sabbath, there was no need for redemption because there was no sin. You see, the Sabbath was not a shadow of redemption in its first function. Later it became a, a symbol of redemption. But in its original function, the Sabbath was to point to God as the creator before sin. So this argument that, you know, the Sabbath uh, came in after sin to illustrate the rest that was going to be given to us in Christ simply does not square with the Genesis story because the Genesis story says that the Sabbath was made by God at the very beginning of history before sin, before there was any need of a Redeemer. Is that clear? Now, let's take a look at the weekly cycle. Henry Morris who uh, was a staunch creationist, uh, he passed away a few, a few years ago, uh, said something very interesting about the weekly cycle of seven days. Do you know why we have a weekly cycle of seven days? Let me ask you, what is the year? The year is the amount of time that it takes our planet to make one complete revolution around the sun, 365 and a quarter days. What is the biblical month? It's the time between one new moon and another. What is the day? It's the amount of time that it takes the earth to make one complete turn on its axis, which is about what? 24 hours. So the year, the month, and the day have an astronomical explanation. But why does the week have seven days? It has no astronomical explanation. It has no reason in nature to have seven days. So why does the week have seven days? It must be that the week has seven days because God, in Genesis it says, established a week of seven days. It has nothing to do with astronomy, with the movements of heavenly bodies. And Henry Morris recognized this when he wrote, The Lord himself had worked six days, then rested on the seventh setting thereby a what? A permanent pattern for the benefit of the Jews. No, that's not what he says. He says a permanent pattern for the benefit of whom? Of mankind. Did, did this individual who is not a Seventh-day Adventist recognize that the weekly cycle was established at creation and that it was to be a permanent pattern throughout all of human history? That's what he's saying. Ellen White was even more explicit. She agrees with Henry Morris, but she's more explicit and more descriptive. Notice in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 111, this is a magnificent statement. She says, she wrote, Like the Sabbath, the week originated at creation, and it has been what? Preserved and brought down to us through Bible history. God Himself measured off. You see, you can see him. He measures off in 24-hour segments, seven 24-hour segments. You can just see God using his measuring stick. So she says, God himself measured off the first week as a what? As a sample for successive weeks to the close of time. Is that exactly what Henry Morris wrote? Absolutely. Then she writes, like every other, it consisted of seven literal days. Six days were employed in the work of creation, and upon the seventh, God rested, and now I want you to catch this. Don't miss it. We're going to come back to this in a few moments. God rested, and what? He then. Now listen carefully. God rested, and He then did what? And then He blessed this day and set it apart as a day of rest for man. When did God set the Sabbath apart as a day of rest for man? When the Sabbath began or when the Sabbath ended? 
when the Sabbath ended after God rested. Are you following me or not? Now, we're going to take a look at that because that's a very, very important point. Now, some people say, Pastor Boar, how do you know that the Sabbath today is the same Sabbath of the days of Christ? Or how do you know that the Sabbath today is the same Sabbath of creation? And I've had uh, non-Adventists ask me this question on several occasions. And I usually ask them a question. I say, okay, let me ask you, which day of the week do you keep? They say, well, we keep Sunday. And I say, why do you keep Sunday? They say, well, because that's the day that Jesus resurrected. So I say, you're telling me that you go to church on Sunday today because that's the very day that Jesus resurrected. Yes, that's what we're saying. And so I tell them, now, wait a minute. If Sunday today is the same Sunday of the resurrection, the Sabbath is the same Sabbath as well. You can't say that Sunday is the same Sunday, but the Sabbath is not the same Sabbath. So you're telling me that the weekly cycle has not changed, at least to the days of Christ. But they say, oh, but how do you know that the weekly cycle goes all the way back to creation? And I tell them, because Jesus was the creator and he would not have kept the wrong day. He kept the day that he established. You know, it's amazing how people seek for excuses to not keep God's holy Sabbath. And you know what Henry Morris does? He just spoils it all. Because shortly after he makes this statement that God established the week as a permanent pattern, he says, but there's no way that we can know that the weekly cycle as we have it today is the same weekly cycle of creation. And so Christians need only keep one day in seven. And in that way, he disposes of the seventh-day Sabbath because he says, we don't know that the weekly cycle today is the same weekly cycle. Well, if God created the weekly cycle, do you think God would preserve the weekly cycle? Especially if the Sabbath was established as the sign of creation? I believe so. You know, it's interesting how some European countries have switched the calendar around. They begin the week on the calendar on Monday. They make Monday the first day. And if you make Monday the first day, what is the seventh day? Sunday. Sunday. What they're trying to do is they're trying to say, see, the seventh day is what? Sunday. But there's a big problem with that. The Bible says that Jesus resurrected the first day, not on the seventh day. So that argument can be clearly disposed of by going to the Bible. But the desire is to change the calendar to make people think that the seventh day is Sunday because they see it on the calendar. When clearly... The weekly cycle begins on Sunday, the first day of the week, and it ends on Sabbath. Are we clear so far? You're saying, what does this have to do with the prophetic chain? Well, just wait. See, all of this is background, especially to what we're going to study tomorrow in our next subject. But we need to first understand worship to the true God and the sign of the true God. Now, another interesting point that we find is that according to Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2, God owns everything. Notice there, Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. The earth is whose? Is the Lord's. In all its fullness, that means everything in it. The world and those who dwell therein. Let me ask you, why is the world and everything in the world the property of God? Here comes the explanation. For, that means because... He has what? Founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So why does everything that God created at the beginning belong to Him? Because He made it. Because He created it. Right? Let me ask you, to whom does the light belong? To God. To whom does the firmament belong? To whom does the vegetation belong? To whom do the sun, moon, and stars belong? To whom do the birds belong? God. To whom do the fish belong? God. To whom do the land animals belong? To whom do man and woman belong? God. To whom does the Sabbath belong? To the Jews. <laughs> now how much sense does that make? <clears throat> Everything God made dear, at creation week, they say, oh yeah, it's God's, it's God's, it's God's. But when you come to the seventh day which God made, they say, for the Jews. In order for the Sabbath to be the Sabbath of the Jews, the Jews would have had to make it. But God made the Sabbath. And therefore the Sabbath belongs to Him just as much as everything else that was made during creation week. 
And that's the reason why the Sabbath in the Bible is referred to as the Sabbath of the Lord your God. It is never called the Sabbath of the Jews. Furthermore, in Isaiah 58, God says, take away your foot from my holy day, is what God is saying. So who owns the Sabbath? The Sabbath is owned by God. Why is it owned by God? Because he made it. He made it just like he made everything else during creation week. It is not something that belongs to the Jews. In fact, everything that God made during creation week, he made for whom? For us. Was this world made for us? Yes, absolutely. So everything was made for us, but the Sabbath was made for the Jews. How much sense? Come on, let's, let's use our reasoning powers. You know, God says, come, let us reason together. He wants things to make sense. So how much sense does it make to say, oh, yeah, everything in this world is, belongs to God, but the Sabbath belongs to the Jews? It's absolutely absurd. It doesn't make any sense. The Sabbath is God's because God made it. And we find in Mark 2.27, Jesus himself said, the Sabbath was made for the Jews. Amen. No, that's not what it says. That's not what it says. He says, the Sabbath was made for what? For men, for anthropos. So Jesus is saying, at the very beginning, the Sabbath, when it was made, it was made for whom? For man. It was not made for the Jews. Now, let's go to another passage which deals with creation. The fourth commandment of God's holy law. Spoken by his own voice and written by his own finger. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Remember, we're going to make comments a little bit later on everything here. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Why would God say that we're supposed to labor six days and we're supposed to rest on the seventh day? Why would he say that? Because he did it first. When did he do it? At creation. The fourth commandment sends us back where? To creation. Notice what verse 11 says, for, that means because in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and now notice this, and rested the seventh day. Is that in the story of Genesis also that God rested the seventh day? Yes. And then what did he do? Blessed the Sabbath day. Is that in the story of creation in Genesis? And hallowed it, or made it holy. Is that in the Genesis story? Are we dealing with the same Sabbath here in the fourth commandment as the creation Sabbath? Absolutely. And God is commanding human beings to what? To keep it. So we know that the fourth commandment is connected with the creation story. The Sabbath of the fourth commandment is the same Sabbath of Genesis. Now, were the days of creation literal? Of course they were. Because God says, you work six and rest the seventh, like I worked six and rested the seventh. It would be ridiculous for God to say that we're supposed to follow his example in working six and resting the seventh if the days of creation were millions of years long. Is that making sense? See, God tells us to reason. Use our reasoning powers. Don't just listen to what people say. Don't just read the newspapers. Don't just go with the flow. You know, go to the Bible and study it for yourself. And if you find it in Scripture, obey it, because it's always best to obey God. In other words, we are to keep the Sabbath following God's what? God's example. He says, keep the Sabbath, work six and rest the seventh, following my example, which I established when? Which I established at creation. Now, did you notice the word remember at the beginning of the fourth commandment? Remember. Interesting. 
Did the Sabbath exist before the law was given on Mount Sinai? Absolutely. Because Israel is asked to what? To remember the Sabbath day. When you're asked to remember something, it's dealing with a past event. You know, we have this expression, remember the Alamo. Now, was the Alamo a historical event? Yeah, so when it says remember the Alamo, it means that you're remembering an event that took place when? In the past. So if the fourth commandment begins by saying, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, did the Sabbath exist before? It did, and we know where it existed before because the same words, seventh day, rested, blessed, sanctified, are used in the fourth commandment as at what? As at creation. Now, I find it very interesting that Christians would agree, if you ask them, uh, should we worship God? Oh, yeah, yeah, we should worship God. Um, why should we worship God? Oh, because He's our Creator. But when you say, uh, you know, should we be reminded of, of, of that? No, that's not important. Let me ask you, is it important to be reminded that God is the Creator? Yes. And what sign did God give to remind us that He is the Creator? The seventh-day Sabbath. Let me add a little sidelight here. The Creator, according to the Bible, was Jesus Christ. You can read that in John 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Jesus was the Creator. It's interesting that Jesus worked six days, and it says that He finished the sixth day, and then He rested the seventh day. Do you know that happened in redemption as well? On the sixth day, Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. And on the seventh day, he rested from his works of redemption in the tomb on the Sabbath. So you can't separate the Redeemer from the Creator and say, the Creator sign is the Sabbath, but the Redeemer's sign is Sunday. Because the Creator is also what? The Creator is also the Redeemer. Now, here we come to a very important point. Protestant theologians will tell you, listen, there is no record in the book of Genesis that Adam and Eve were commanded to keep the Sabbath. There is not any evidence in Genesis where God told Adam and Eve, keep the seventh-day Sabbath. And so they argue that the Sabbath was not a creation institution because there's no direct command in the creation story where God told Adam and Eve that they had to keep the Sabbath. So the question is, why didn't God, why don't we find in the pages of Genesis, God commanding Adam and Eve to keep the seventh-day Sabbath? The reason is that the Sabbath had to be created before God could command Adam and Eve to keep it. Let's read two texts from the Old Testament. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3. You know, there's this, con this concept that, you know, God told Adam and Eve to keep that first Sabbath. When the Sabbath was beginning, God told Adam and Eve, okay, now this day you're going to keep. In other words, the idea that God blessed and sanctified the Sabbath when the day was beginning. The Bible doesn't teach that. Notice Genesis 2 verse 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Why did God bless the Sabbath and sanctify it? Because in it he what? Rested. So let me ask you, did God rest first and then bless and sanctify the day? That's what the text says. It says, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from his work which God had created and made. So God rests and then he what? And then he blesses and he sanctifies the Sabbath. So when is the Sabbath blessed and sanctified? When that first Sabbath was beginning or when the first Sabbath came to an end? When the first Sabbath came to an end. Let's notice another text. And you say, what difference does it make? You'll see in a minute. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. This is the conclusion of the fourth commandment. We just read it. But now I want to underline a very important point. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth the sea, and all that is in them, 
and rested the seventh day. Do you notice that in many versions there's a period there? In Hebrew, it's called the athnak. And uh, there, there's, there's an athnak in, in Hebrew where, where uh, when there's a period, it means that this, uh, this event finished and now the reason is going to be given. Notice what it says after the period. So it says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day, period. Therefore, what did God do? The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Why did God bless and hallow the seventh day? Why did He make it holy? Because what? Because He had rested on that day. So does God rest and bless and sanctify the Sabbath all at the same time? No. God rests upon it. His rest makes the day holy and a blessed day. And when the day ends, God says, this day is now blessed. This day is now what? This day is now holy. Now you say, why is this important? There's a very important reason. You see, God made the Sabbath by resting on it. Did He? Did God make the Sabbath by resting on it? He most certainly did. And then after He had made it, what did He do? He gave it to man. Let me ask you, could God give the Sabbath to man before He made it? <laughs> Are you following me or not? Could God give all the things of the first six days of creation week to man without making them first? No. So God makes the Sabbath by His rest. The Sabbath becomes blessed and holy by His rest. And then when He's made the Sabbath, then God says to Adam and Eve, Now the Sabbath is what? Is for you. So the Sabbath becomes holy when it ends. And it's holy because God rested on the day. Now we can understand why God didn't command Adam and Eve to rest on that first Sabbath. Because they, God could not tell them to keep the Sabbath holy if it wasn't holy until it ended. You're not following me. Are you following me? When did the Sabbath become holy? When it ended. So how could God tell them when that Sabbath was beginning, keep the Sabbath holy if it wasn't holy yet? Further, even further, Adam and Eve were supposed to follow God's example in observing the Sabbath. But how could Adam and Eve follow God's example of Sabbath keeping unless God showed them how to do it? Let me read you three statements from the writings of Ellen White. The, the little lady understood this. Notice, she never got it wrong. She, she clearly says each time in her writings that God rested, and after He rested, when He had rested the last second, then God said, this day is now blessed and this day is holy. And then when He had created the day, He gives it to Adam and Eve. Now notice this statement. The first one is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 47. After resting upon the seventh day. What was that? Do you, do you understand what the word after means? <laughs> after resting upon the seventh day. God sanctified it. When was the Sabbath sanctified? After He rested. After resting upon the seventh day, God sanctified it or set it apart as a day of rest for man. When did the Sabbath become a day of rest for man? When the first Sabbath what? Ended. I hope you got this point. Very important. So after resting upon the seventh day, God sanctified it or set it apart as a day of rest for man. Now listen to this. Following the example of the Creator, how could God tell Adam and Eve to keep the Sabbath if He didn't show them how to do it first? That's why it's called the Sabbath of the Lord, because God rested first. Continue saying, following the example of the Creator, man was to rest upon this sacred day, that as he should look upon the heavens and the earth, he might reflect upon God's great work of creation, and that as he should behold the evidences of God's wisdom and goodness, his heart might be filled with love and reverence for his Maker. Do you know what God did on that first Sabbath? You know, the book of Job kind of gives us a little inkling, Job 38, verses 4 through 7. 
describes creation, and then it says that all of the heavenly universe shouted and sang for joy. It describes creation, then it says they all sang. So I can imagine what God did on that seventh day. By the way, Adam and Eve were there. They were observing what God was doing. They were observing God's Sabbath observance. What was God doing? Oh, he was taking them on a scenic tour of the garden. See, how, how do you like those flowers? <laughs> oh, Lord, those flowers are so beautiful. They smell so nice. What about these fruits? Here, have a taste of this apple. Mmm, Lord, this is delicious. In other words, God delighted on the seventh day in his work of creation. The Bible teaches that. And then when the day ends and Adam and Eve has seen God delight in his work of creation, God says to Adam and Eve, now you've seen how I've done it. Now, next Sabbath, you do it that way. Are you understanding this? God first had to give the example. Here's another statement, Desire of Ages 281. Because he had rested upon the Sabbath, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Why did God bless and sanctify the Sabbath? Because he had rested. And when did he give it to Adam? When the day began or when it ended? It says he gave it to Adam as a day of rest. After he rested, he gave it to Adam as a day of rest. It was a what? A memorial of the work of creation and thus a what? A sign. It's a memorial and a sign of God's power and his love. Now let me go, uh, le let me just mention one more thing so that this is absolutely clear. Do you know the fourth commandment applies to Adam and Eve beginning with the second week of history? You say, now why would that be? Because the fourth commandment says, work six and rest the seventh like I worked six and rest of the seventh, but Adam and Eve had not worked six. Are you following me? And so God works six, he rests the seventh, and then he says to Adam and Eve, by the way, you know, I did all of this in six days. You saw me rest on the seventh. He says, now tomorrow your six days start. And you're going to work six days, and the next seventh day you're going to keep the Sabbath the way you saw me keep it. Is this making sense? So God established the Sabbath as a creation institution. God did not command Adam and Eve to keep that first Sabbath because the Sabbath wasn't holy yet. God had to give the example. God had to rest first. The Sabbath is first of all God's Sabbath. And then after he makes it, what does he do? He gives it to man. Incidentally, the Bible tells us that at the second coming of Jesus, this earth will be returned to the condition it was in before creation. Jeremiah the prophet Jeremiah saw this. It's in fact chapter 4, verse 23. He says, I beheld the earth, and it was without form and void, and darkness was over the earth. Is that the condition of the earth before creation week? Absolutely. So the world is going to return to a great degree to the condition it was in before creation week. So is God going to perform another work of creation? Is he going to create a new heavens and a new earth? How many days do you think God is going to use to create a new heavens and a new earth? You know, I used to think that God would instantaneously say, uh, he would instantaneously say, let there be everything that there was before. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Go with me to Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. Isaiah 66, 22 and 23. Three ideas that I want us to notice in this verse. Three ideas in these two verses. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me. So is God going to do a new work of creation, new heavens and new earth? Yes, he's going to create again. That's the first point. So shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, don't get all hung up over that, the new moon marks the beginning of the month. The Spanish version says from month to month, de mes en mes. So the new moon simply means that from month to month, and the Bible says that we will go from month to month to eat from the tree of life because the tree of life produces its fruit every month, Revelation 22 and verse 2. But not only every month, it says, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sunday to another, ah, thank you very much, you're still awake out there, and from what, from what? One Sabbath to another, all flesh, not all the Jews, if you have flesh, you'd be there if you're saved, all flesh shall come to what? To worship before me, says the Lord. 
What are the three ideas that are connected in these verses? Number one, creation. Number two, worship. And number three, the sign of worship, which is the Sabbath. Is that found in Genesis and in the fourth commandment as well? It's found in Genesis and in Exodus. The same will happen at the end. How much sense does it make to say, well, at creation, it was the Sabbath. You know, all throughout the Old Testament, it was the Sabbath. Jesus went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. The apostles in the books of Acts kept the Sabbath. In the new heavens and new earth, it's going to be Sabbath. But meanwhile, Sunday. Come on. Let's use our heads. You know, God doesn't, doesn't want us to go simply by emotion about what others say. Christians follow simply what they're said. Even ministers follow what they've, taught, they've been taught in the seminary. Go to the Bible for yourself. Think, pray, and ask God for light. And when God has given you the light, obey the light, no matter what's, what it might cost you. The Sabbath is not only a memorial of creation. The Sabbath is also a sign between God and his people. It is the seal of God between him and his people. Let's read Exodus 31, 16 and 17. Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. Let's stop there for a moment. See, people say, see, it's only the children of Israel that shall keep the Sabbath. We'll come back to that in a minute. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. But now notice the reason why God says that, it, that Israel should keep the Sabbath. It says, it is a what? A sign between me and the children of Israel forever. And now comes the reason. For, that is because... In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Let me ask you, is the reason for Israel keeping the Sabbath the reason at creation before the entrance of sin? Absolutely, because this harks back to what? It harks back to creation as the reason. Now, let's deal with the issue where it says here that, that therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. Let me ask you this. Did God give all of the Ten Commandments to Israel at Mount Sinai? So, uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's only for Israel. Uh, did, uh, um, now, you shall not make any graven image or worship it. That was only for Israel. God gave the Ten Commandments to Israel. Don't take the name of the Lord God in vain. That's only for Israel. God gave the Ten Commandments to Israel. Honor your father and your mother. That was for Israel. God gave the Ten Commandments to Israel. You shall not kill. That was for Israel. God gave the Ten Commandments to Israel. You shall not commit adultery. Only for Israel. God gave the Ten Commandments to Israel. You shall not steal. Oh, praise the Lord. We can steal all we want. <laughs> because the commandment was given to Israel at Mount Sinai. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Ah, that's for Israel. The Ten Commandments were given to Israel. Don't covet. Only for Israel. God gave the Ten Commandments for Israel. So, so they, what they do is they say, oh no, the, uh, the Ten Commandments were for everybody except the Sabbath. God gave all of the Ten Commandments to Israel. But nowhere does it say that the Ten Commandments were given exclusively for Israel. God gave the Ten Commandments to Israel because those were, her pe his, those were his people at that day and age. But it doesn't mean that the Ten Commandments did not apply to everyone after that because the, because the Ten Commandments are God's moral law for the entirety of humanity. Are you understanding my point? Nowhere does it say exclusively. And by the way, the reason why Israel is to keep the Sabbath is because they are to be reminded that it is a sign that God is the creator. So only Israel needs to remember the creator. We don't have to remember the creator. We don't have to keep the Sabbath to remember the creator. Only Israel needs to be reminded that God was the creator. Come on, be real. Don't, doesn't everybody, don't Christians have to be reminded that God is the creator? Yes, and what is the sign that God gave or the memorial that God gave to remind us every week that God was the creator? It is the seventh-day Sabbath. Furthermore, 
Galatians 3, 28 and 29 says that if we are Christ, we are Abraham's seed. So if we are Abraham's seed, we are Israel. And if we are Israel, we must keep the Sabbath. Are you understanding me or not? Besides that, Isaiah 54, 56, 4 through 7, says that the Sabbath, even in the Old Testament, was for the Gentiles, not only for the Jews. My house will be called a house of prayer for all the Jews. That's not what it says, for all people. And it's speaking in the context about the Gentiles. Furthermore, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for whom? The Sabbath was made for man. So let's not say that simply because it says that the Sabbath is a sign between God and Israel, that it's not a sign between God and the rest of the people after Israel. Because it was not made only for Israel. Don't add the word only or the word exclusively there to uh, Exodus chapter 31. Now there's another passage that speaks of the Sabbath as a sign. Notice Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12 and verse 20. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a what? A sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who what? Who sanctifies them. And then verse 20 says, Hallow my Sabbaths, that means keep them holy, and they will be, once again, what? A sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Some people say, how do you know that these are not the ceremonial Sabbaths? Very simple. There is no evidence in the Bible that the ceremonial Sabbaths were ever, were ever a sign between God and His people. Secondly, the word sign is the identical word that is used in Exodus 31 where we just notice that the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath is the sign. And furthermore, it says here in Ezekiel chapter 20 that the Sabbath is a sign that God sanctifies His people. Let me ask you, does the, do the feasts have anything to do with God sanctifying His people? No, it's the fourth commandment that says that God sanctified which? The seventh day of the week. So this is dealing with the seventh day Sabbath. Are we clear on this point? Now, the Bible tells us that at the very end of time, and I believe that we're in that end of time, God will raise up a people to proclaim three messages from the book of Revelation. They're known as the three angels' message. They're actually one message with three parts. And I want you to notice the first angel's message. We are told in Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7 in language very similar to Genesis and very similar to Exodus chapter 20, the following. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, notice what this angel is proclaiming, fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and now notice this, and what? And worship Him who what? who made heaven and earth and the springs of water. What does the first angel command? By the way, did you notice that it doesn't say that this message goes to the Jews? The command to worship, it says, it goes to every nation, to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Is this a universal message for everyone? The call to worship God because He is the Creator. By the way, would that involve the Sabbath as well? Would the first angel's message bring attention of the people of worshiping God because He's the Creator and the sign of the Creator is the Sabbath? We notice that in Scripture. You can't separate the Sabbath from the idea of worshiping God because He's the Creator because the Sabbath is the sign of the Creator. You can't get rid of the sign and say that you worship God. You know, it's like Christians, they say, you know, oh yeah, I believe that I should worship God and I should worship God because He's the Creator, but don't remind me of it. God gave us a weekly reminder. Does God want us to remember that He's the Creator and that we're supposed to worship the Creator? Absolutely. He gave us a weekly sign. By the way, God will have that same sign at the end of time. Notice Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. Revelation 7, verses 1 to 3. 
After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. In other words, God is holding back the winds of strife in this world. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having what? The seal of the living God. If you go to Romans 4.11, seal and sign are used interchangeably. Those two words basically mean the same thing. So it says, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Does God have a seal or a sign between him and his people? Yes. What is that sign according to what we've studied? The book of Ezekiel and Exodus 31 says that that sign is what? The seventh-day Sabbath. So let's review the three essential points of what we've studied. And this will set the stage for the other side of the coin in our next lecture. Number one, we worship the true God because He is what? Because He is the Creator. And the sign that He is the Creator is the seventh-day Sabbath. But now listen up. In the book of Revelation, we have a power that is called the beast. We've studied about the beast, haven't we? And this beast is going to claim to be God on earth because he is going to demand what? Worship. Does the beast also have a mark or a sign that he's going to put on the forehead and on the right hand? Yes. Is that sign a mark of the beast's authority? Like the seal or the sign of God is the sign of God's authority. Yes. In fact, listen carefully to what I'm going to say. The first angel's message says, worship the Creator. And even though it doesn't mention the Sabbath, we know that the Sabbath is the sign of the Creator. The third angel's message says, don't worship the beast. It is the other side of the coin. The first angel says, worship the true God, the Creator. Keep His sign. The third angel's message says, woe to you if you worship the beast and you receive His sign because you're going to be lost. Now, if the sign of God is the Sabbath, what would be the opposite sign of the beast? It must be another day because it is the opposite. Are you with me or not? And so in our next study, we are going to study about the beast demanding worship, and we're going to talk about his sign, the great dividing issue in the world at the end of time. <music>